Hello and welcome to Rajya Sabha Television. You're watching the Big Picture with me, Frank Rausen Ferreira. Senior diplomats of India and Nepal on August 17th held a virtual meeting to review the progress made on various India aid developmental projects being implemented in the Himalayan nation. The meeting came days after Nepal Prime Minister KP Sharma Oli telephoned Prime Minister Narendra Modi to greet him on India's 74th Independence Day in the first high-level contact after bilateral ties came under severe strain. According to the Indian Embassy in Kathmandu, India and Nepal held the eighth meeting of the oversight mechanism through digital video conferencing. The meeting carried out a comprehensive review of bilateral economic and development cooperation projects. In this edition of The Big Picture, we will analyze the high-level talks between India and Nepal. Joining me on the program today are Manjeev Singh Puri, former ambassador, Shakti Sinha, foreign affairs expert and director, Delhi School of Public Policy and Governance, and Professor Tej Pratap Singh, International Politics, Banaras Hindu University. Thank you to all my guests for joining me on this edition of The Big Picture. All right, Ambassador, let me start the program with you. So let's first understand what the oversight mechanism is and what were the key takeaways from the eighth meeting. Uh, Frank, thank you very much. First of all, I want to thank Rajya Sabha TV and you in particular for focusing on India's development partnership program. Uh, and let me just throw in something. Nepal is actually the starting point of India's development partnership way back in the 1950s. So it's a long history. Now, we have a large number of development projects in Nepal and also other projects which will contribute significantly to the Nepalese economy. Given a variety of reasons, in 2016, it was decided that there would be a mechanism which is essentially a meeting between the Indian Embassy and the government of Nepal to review these projects, look at any issues which are coming up and which can be resolved at that particular level. And this is the eighth such meeting which has taken place. The meeting has the Indian ambassador along with his uh, various officers who look after it and such projects as are represented in Nepal, their managers, etc. And on the Nepalese side, the foreign secretary of Nepal heads it. Now, the most important thing about this oversight mechanism meeting is that it brings the entire government of Nepal, which is involved with the execution of these partnership projects on the same table. So the foreign secretary chairs the meeting, but high level officials from all concerned ministries, departments and agencies of Nepal are present. Now, usually these meetings are held at an interval of about six months, but COVID has resulted in this not having been possible the last several months. And so they did what was the best possible, which was to have a meeting using uh, virtual technology online. I believe this meeting was very important. You know, I come from the field of diplomacy. As far as I am concerned, words are very important. Dialogue is very important. And the fact that Prime Minister Oli telephoned Prime Minister Sri Narendra Modi on the occasion of our Independence Day, they had a conversation which included, by the way, India's election to the Security Council, the actions on COVID that the two countries are taking. You know, it is important that these dialogues take place. And after that, we have this highest level possible dialogue at the level of the embassy and the foreign ministry, i.e. at the Kathmandu level, which is possible, which reviews the entire gamut. So this itself is perhaps the biggest takeaway. Frank, give me a second to just tell you that even while we are talking about all the southward bound movements in terms of political and diplomatic relations with Nepal, normal things have continued. Trade has continued. Development partnership projects have continued. In fact, the Indian Embassy signed a project uh, a proposal with the Nepalese government for sanitation project in the Pashupadinath temple complex. So normal things have continued. Humanitarian things have gone on. Our assistance to Nepal on COVID has gone on. And it's particularly important that these two countries, which share the widest possible set of relations at the level of the people, at the level of the economies, and at society's general level, that those things continue. The song and dance, and I'm using these words deliberately, of diplomacy continues. It must be set, at, uh, set in order because these are very important paradigm setting institutional arrangements. And when they don't work very well, they tend to have an impact on the other. So I believe that these contacts, these meetings have been very good. 
but these meetings have to be met with real action and in that sense it is my considered belief that the ball is in the nepalese court they need to take some concrete action to be able to bring right or to in some senses make the entire business of the india nepal relations come back to a proper even keel which benefits the people of the two absolutely i think very aptly and right very rightly said there and i think you put it in all in perspective for us let me bring in uh, uh, dp singh into the picture now so what are the kind of development projects that india is assisting nepal with and uh, how has india helped nepal in the past as well yeah uh, the kind of project india is executing in nepal it's a various kind of all kind of projects are there so firstly i will talk about the infrastructural project here so uh, so they are uh, the main focus is on the connectivity yeah. so india is building the roads uh, the railway lines uh, and so here uh, I, i will mention this uh, as china is also uh, uh, making this uh, trans himalayan uh, uh, railway and connecting uh, nepal with china so here now india is also uh, focused on uh, uh, building this uh, uh, raksol kathmandu uh, Uh, railway line on priority basis the work has started and uh, so uh, now the one problem with uh, india has been that india has been accused that the problem gets delayed so the completion of the pro, uh, project within the stipulated time has been the main challenge and it is because of that many mechanism has been created and this meeting which uh, happened on monday it was also in that background to review the uh, progress of the project so that uh, at at uh, stipulated time the project is completed here i will refer to the motihari and uh, uh, motihari uh, amlek ganj uh, pipeline here. so it has been uh, completed before its schedule yeah. so it has been an important achievement and this shows the focus of the government and the priority given to the instead of uh, coming up with the new project the uh, objective should be the completion of the project uh, uh, within the stipulated time so this has been the major achievement before the uh, stipulated time it has been completed inaugurated it has been operationalized so and uh, there has been many other projects the projects you talked about so we have the hydro power projects pancheswar has been discussed uh, on monday so pancheswar uh, it, it is uh, continuing for many years so pancheswar hydro project is there uh, many hydro power projects are there irrigation projects are there and another is the is the uh, uh, projects related to power so energy trade yeah. india and bhutan they have very beneficial uh, uh, energy trade and in fact uh, the main uh, 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 foreign exchange earner for bhutan is the their chukha hydel power project so major uh, a large portion of their uh, hydel power they are exporting to india so they are uh, making lot uh, lot of money the bhutan government is doing it same kind of thing happened with uh, uh, nepal also because nepal has tremendous hydro power potential and it has not been exploited yet even nepal is having the power shortage problem the nepal which can be the power surplus because of the non uh, uh, implementation of the project uh, the completion of the project they are having the acute shortage of power so india has uh, fixed that uh, very soon they will be uh, uh, importing 600 megawatt of power from uh, nepal but that will happen in the future so hydro power projects are uh, uh, another in pipeline and we, uh, the irrigation projects uh, many uh, 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 barrages have been made by india that is uh, uh, irrigating the land in nepal also irrigating uh, land in uh, india also mm -hmm. so uh, so those are the projects and so we have all kind of projects uh, development but here uh, we can refer this uh, integrated check uh, check post here so four check post has to be uh, created by india so two uh, birganj and biratnagar has been operationalized has been inaugurated but uh, two more has to be completed so uh, so these are uh, important uh, projects right. and then uh, uh, high impact community development projects uh, that is also being undertaken there so the all kind of project which is benefiting the nepali community <coughs> which is benefiting the, uh, uh, the nepal nepal industry so all kind of projects has been undertaken by the government of india and right. uh, government of india is investing a lot in these projects sure okay so wide array of projects uh, like the professor uh, has already mentioned so shakti sena this issue you know every time we talk about the neighborhood every time we talk about india assisting 
our neighbors and projects this issue of timely delivery keeps coming up even nepal has had this similar kind of a problem how do we improve on that what do we do and are, have there any assurances been given in this um, you know 8th osm uh very good question frank and i'm glad you raised it professor just mentioned pancheshwar i was there in kathmandu in 1996 january pranam mukherjee was a foreign minister when we discussed pancheshwar for the first time and came to an agreement so deoba was the prime minister this is 1996 we and nepal are still negotiating the water use or the mahakali or the sharda as we call it today now i'm not saying india is to blame for that the fact is that we have not been able to make progress when mahakali's potential is at least 5000 megawatts arun 3 finally we have done the financial closure in the month of may it's a 900 megawatt project the loan amount is about 6500000 crores indian crore plus equity so billion plus dollars in it that again started 2008 is being done now now these two are mentioned because power projects and is a serious problem it does get delayed but not so much 23 years 24 years a bit too much one of the major problems is with ambassador manji very rightly mentioned is in doing projects in nepal if you look at the uh, hulaki the rajmarg the east west postal road look at the jogbani uh, biratnagar uh, railway line look at the other projects the biggest problem is land now we give the money maybe our contractors or their contractors jointly do it but the land has to be made available and in nepal the process of getting land is difficult there is issues involved i don't want to burn fingers if there are capacity issues involved there are legal issues involved and to some extent the weaknesses on our side also because our ability historically to deal with land and development issues is not very strong it has changed for the better and i'm not saying it because manjeev is sitting here it has dramatically changed for the better in the last few years but the fact remains that we have to one one strengthen our capacities to deal with these issues because land people who own the land people who rent the land to labor on the land so if you must look after all the project affected persons nepali law only looks at the title holder in any case title holders again have problems once where the road is built are very happy land price goes up the only land is built that i'm happy because the prices won't go up unless in the other station there will be reason but when the nepali government does a project with the world bank or adb and they have this rigid guidelines these people do really ramp up their performance and deliver So I think we improve our capacity and do a bit of tough love with the Nepalese government. Ki listen, land you have to provide for. We ask for ninety percent land in advance. This is difficult for us. On a World Bank project, they provide hundred percent of land before one dollar moves. In other words, it is there are capacity issues on Nepalese side. I don't blame them for it. Let's work with them. And ourselves also, we have improved. And now project implementation has really changed for the better. I've seen it in Afghanistan. I've seen it in Nepal. it has changed for the better but we still have to sort out our internal problems financial closure average bureaucrat like me do not know how to do financial closure we must get in the professionals at the right time to do proper dprs which look at the terrain the rajmarg the classic case but the terrain was a problematic thing and some shortcuts were done by the contractors we frank which are the two problems for the government of india so i think we need to ramp up our capacities to do better projects by doing preparatory work you do a preparatory work a little longer the project is executed much faster actually we want to start your project that is tension is involved here. you know just a quick follow up question before i go to uh, manji puri you know on the, on this issue of land acquisition we are all familiar with the land acquisition and you know uh, how painstaking it is in india and since you've been associated with the system here as well i mean i must ask you this is 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 it more pro- problematic in nepal it is more it is more complicated in nepal for the simple reason we have more litigations fine there the process of fixing of price through the cdc is not a very transparent process and for the same project they have awarded different rates to different people right that's a matter of rent seeking behavior but in india it is also possible if you go to goa and goa university was acquired by us in 3 months flat they went to the courts nothing happened because mm. we did a homework properly so it is possible to do it india has become increasingly more difficult now because land prices have gone up mm. 30 or 20 years ago we could acquire land with our left hand 
because people were very happy land will be acquired. Today they see the potential, not today. They know that if the land is acquired, area will develop. By price will go up five times. So he is already programming five times into his imputed land value, which today does not take exist. So right. there are different tension. Paperwork is an issue there. Paperwork is a serious issue in Nepal. Okay, taking the discussion forward now, talking about some of these concerns, talking about how there are several issues, uh, you know, at hand, Ambassador. So, how can we address some of these concerns? What needs to be done? And apart from, you know, uh, timely delivery, are there any other concerns really as far as these developmental projects are concerned? Uh, Frank, first of all, I want to thank both uh, uh, Mr. T.P. Singh as well as uh, Mr. Shakti Sena for mentioning the Amlek Ganj pipeline and please allow me to take a bow. I was ambassador when we started the project and I had the privilege of being there when the virtual inauguration took place nearly six, eight months ahead of schedule. Let me tell you what we did with the land issue. There was a major problem because, you know, remember the Terai is very densely populated and therefore the issues of land acquisition are real issues of land acquisition. And of course, there is bureaucratic uh, lethargy, there is political unwillingness to be able to take unpalatable decisions. We know them all. So what did we do? Finally, we said we need to put this pipeline underground. And to put it underground, a technological solution had to be found. Now, you can't find such technological solution with, let's say, a road project. And you can't find it with so many other things. But lots of use of modern technology was put into place for the pipeline project. And so I'm afraid the answer somewhat lies in a little bit more financial investment, much more technology, and much more management oriented. Yeah. Now, let me tell you what are the big issues that some of the issues are such that you know you don't really know how to address them because they are the same kind of issues which we used to face in India with development projects many, many years back till we became used to trying to work fast deliver. One is land. The other is these financial closures and stuff like that. The third is some of the elements of work in Nepal, for example, this railway line, is extremely difficult to do technologically. It's not easy. Neither is it easy for our friends from China. It's very, very difficult. These are young fold mountains. Building these railway tracks is not easy. Otherwise, let me tell you, the British would have done it. But these technological challenges have to be overcome. We have this land acquisition. We also have another set of problems that our contractors, especially the best contractors in India, in the 1970s and 80s, they used to go to Nepal. Now they don't find it worth their money. So you end up with contractors who are kind of middling. They tend to have their own issues. They have issues back home in India, which tend to get offloaded there. They tend to have partnerships with people in Nepal. They are just a front bidding for the contract for the sake of the paper. The people in Nepal don't have the abilities to deliver, but they've entered into this contract. It's a bit of a complex issue. Let me tell you the same complex issues face even the Chinese. Even they have the similar sets of problems in Nepal. And so does the World Bank and the ADB. Their projects are not running anywhere. You ask them, they have the same set of problems. Nepal is a very difficult country. Because it's a country which has not yet embraced fully the idea of development and the right. idea of going all out for growth. Uh, remember, the quality there also, you know, while it's very good to talk about social justice, very good to talk about inclusion, Nepal is a changing society with about 25% of the Nepalese population overseas, whether working in the Gulf or in the United States or in Europe the ideas and aspirations of the country are changing. But its politics continues to be kind of rooted in an era which is sort of bygone. Now, in these kind of circumstances, you know, you run into a number of sets of issues which need to be always overcome. And in that sense, Nepal is quite different even from other countries in South Asia, including Afghanistan or Bangladesh or Sri sure. Lanka, where the exposure to globalization is longer, older, and where this embrace of development is of a far greater one. So we have to work hard. We need to pull up, let me say, our socks, both in terms of the financial element, the technological and the managerial aspects which are required. And I believe 
that the MEA, our development partnership wing, the territorial division dealing with it at the highest level of the Honorable Minister and others, they remain engaged with us. And it is each of these particular things which gives us the kind of necessary push to be able to take things forward because for many, many years, actually nothing happened. Before I end, let me draw your attention to some of the other huge things which happened in the last few years. Not only the Zamlai Ganj pipeline, our own three projects, for which the financial closure Mr. Sinha mentioned happened in May. But the project's work started more than a year back. It is now more than 20% complete. This is the largest project taking place in uh, Nepal. And when it Nepal. comes on steam, not only will it alter the electricity dynamic of Nepal, but actually have an impact on its economy. That's the right. nature Absolutely. of this project. Yeah, two yeah, interested checkpoints which have been done. Absolutely. Good. All right. Taking the discussion forward and widening the scope of the discussion a little bit now. So, T.P. Singh, what is the level of economic cooperation between the two countries and how has it developed? Yeah, as we say here while talking about this India-Nepal relation, so usually we refer to the roti Veti relation. So, here roti refers to all the economic cooperation, all the economic issues and the Veti uh, refers to the cultural and civilizational ties, the family relation. Uh, in fact, uh, my ancestral village on the Nepal border. So, personally, I have seen what this. It is an integrated market, here, and it is the border is open. So, he, the local people, the local community, they don't feel that what is India, what is Nepal. Marketing purpose: Indians go to Nepal, Nepalis come to India. So, it is an integrated market. Coming to the economic cooperation, here. so uh, uh, because of it's uh, uh, obvious that India is the largest trading partner of uh, Nepal. Uh, they, uh, in 2018-19, uh, 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 they had 8.27 billion dollars bilateral, and uh, this was the largest uh, uh, trade of Nepal with any country. The trade imbalance is in favor of India, and this issue has to be addressed here yeah, because the Indian export to Nepal was 7.7 .7 billion dollars. Yeah. So this uh, trade surplus is usually in favor of India. So this issue has to be the addressed by the. Uh, Government of India and Nepal together, because this kind of imbalance trade cannot uh, continue in the future as we are having the problem with China. So the uh, and the next thing is that uh, the issue of remittances. We have eight million Nepalese living and working in India, and on the other hand, we have uh, six hundred uh, thousand Indians living and working in Nepal. So remittances are going from Nepal to India and India to Nepal. So the remittances is another issue that's binding two economies together, binding the two nations together. And then uh, for energy needs, uh, Nepal is, as we all know, is dependent upon India and this Motihari and this Amlekanj, this pipeline uh, is part of that. Mm -hmm. And even in the power also, uh, we are dependent upon each other right now we are exporting but in future we will be importing from uh, nepal when they will have surplus power production and the investment there yeah. india is the largest investor in nepal yeah. the 30 percent more than 30 percent the foreign direct investment in nepal is coming from india more than 150 indian companies are uh, working in in, uh, in nepal so this uh, from investment point of view also uh, this uh, economic cooperation between these two countries are uh, very closer to each other. So trade, commerce, business, investment, remittances, there are many issues which bring the Nepal and India together and they are so much intertwined with each other that despite the political effort, these two economies can't be separated. Right. Okay. Points taken. Now let me uh, bring in another aspect as well. You know, Shakti Sinha, there have been irritants really as far as the bilateral relationship of late is concerned. Is it now time to, you know, put that on the back burner and focus on the positives? There was the phone call, of course, that uh, Prime Minister K.P. Sharma only yeah. made to the Indian Prime Minister Modi. So is it now time to build on these positives? One good thing you will see is that in the last three, four months, while there have been a lot of strong statements coming out of Kathmandu, Delhi has been extremely, extremely restrained in its behavior, absolutely restrained. So in that sense, we have been very, very clear. We understand the irritants are there. We don't want to raise a controversy. So we have shown the path that it is possible. And we will we'll not get into the details of the domestic Nepalese reasons for all these controversies and other stuff. But I think through this meeting, Prime Minister Oli's call, it's clear that 
in the long run, you understand that you have to live with India. And India, in any case, even China, if you look at, there is no serious Chinese project in Nepal. Let us be very clear. The railway line has been talked about, will remain talked about. Economically, it makes no sense unless the railway line comes to India. Good is meant for India. You know, it won't make sense. So we have to work together. Arun is a good thing, and I'm happy that the project work was started with equity. Normally, we wait for the debt to happen. Arun, they started with equity itself. It's a rare case, very good example. But we actually have to proactively move on a number of these projects, including sorting out Pancheshpur. If you agree on the water sharing of the Sharda, and it is not very difficult to do so, we have to be a little more realistic. It is possible oh. to move on Pancheshpur. To move on Pancheshpur and complete these projects, the message you are sending is, we are happy to be engaged with you. We are not being, going to be put off by these controversies. And I think that is a very, very positive step. Trade is an issue which they raise every now and then. Once there's a conference in Kathmandu and they said trade deficit is very big. I said, you are right. But do you know that 70% of Nepalese exports come to India? Even if it becomes 100%, the trade deficit won't change. Why? You're importing petroleum from India. You're importing steel from India, machinery from India. Where else will you get it from? So, you know, you have to be a little gentle about it. But the fact remains that there's nothing you can do about certain things. Where you can do is on these projects and on political engagement, I think the way forward should be positive. Talking about the way forward, very quick closing comments from uh, all my panelists with the best way forward in 30 seconds each, starting first with you, Ambassador. Frank, I am glad that there are attempts now at thawing the diplomatic ice. I see this positively, but I am very firmly convinced that you need to follow this up with real action. Pancheshwar, of course, is the dream, but you know, it's a long way off. But let us look at concrete projects, concrete things, which will tend to take it forward. And let us not underestimate in all of this that there are political angles because that sets the ecosystem under Absolutely. which things operate. And right. for that, I sincerely believe the ball is in the Nepalese court. As Mr. Sinha says, India has been very mature, very very restrained in what they have said and what we have done. But the Nepalese need to understand that their interest lies in being able to leverage a positive relationship with India. And this is something that uh, is an important element. The special right. relationship, whether you call it that or not, has got to be maintained and should be maintained. And I believe that is what would be good for the quality of Nepal, the society, the economy, and of course, certainly for India. Because this is a situation where the two people come together. And what we can do, it can only be win-win for both sides. And Absolutely. we must work. Absolutely. T.P. Singh. Yeah, uh, we have this uh, civilizational and cultural ties with uh, Nepal, and it should be strengthened. And here, uh, we have already uh, signed this uh, twinning cities there. Yeah. So for Hinduism, the Vishwanath and Paspatinath, uh, Varanasi and Kathmandu twin cities. And then another twinning is the Buddhism. They have brought uh, Bodh Gaya and Lumani together. That is another. And then uh, uh, we have uh, uh, third one uh, twinning this uh, uh, Ajadhya and Hinduism. Yeah. This, uh, again, Hinduism, the Ajadhya and Janakpur. So this uh, people to people relations should be already excellent and it should be strengthened further. And we have also be to be sensitive towards our small neighbors here. Yeah. Okay, all right. And uh, Shakti Sinha, close the show for us with a quick concluding remark. Very quickly, I think Manjeev is absolutely right. The ball is on the other side. We have shown our restraint. We have shown our willingness to accommodate. Yes, we should be sensitive. I completely agree. We both sides have made mistakes in the past. Absolutely, no point hiding from it. But we can't dwell in the past. We are prepared to look forward. Let's look forward to work together because it is the interest of the people of both sides that we work together. And as, in that sense, relatively the smaller country, the stakes are much higher for Nepal in that sense. And therefore, it makes sense for us also to be a little more large heart. I'm fine with that. Okay, all right. On that note, then I'll call it a wrap on this edition of The Big Picture. Thank you to all my guests for joining me on the program and putting things into perspective for us. What's coming out of this discussion is that there have been irritants in the bilateral relationship of late, but the high-level 8th oversight mechanism meeting is a positive development. It is important to keep the dance and song of diplomacy going. The meeting has come at an opportune time, one that both nations can build on. There are concerns as far as developmental projects are concerned, 
but we have to stay focused push through and get them done they will benefit both nations in the long run india and nepal have made mistakes let's not dwell on the past but look forward with a positive mindset with that it's a wrap see you again next time